everybody feel as registry operators that they're, we're one solid step removed from this debate in any event? Because our job is to keep the infrastructure resolving, full stop. We don't get into content. We don't maintain websites per se. But there are registries, and I just described that function. There are registrars who sell the domain names and have a contract with the registrant. There are web host service providers. There are ISPs. There are payment service providers. It's really first and foremost important to understand the different roles and responsibilities of service providers before we can get into a substantive discussion of this type of question. But, but 230 does provide some protection for each of those players in that ecosystem, correct? It certainly does. Right. And so we would benefit as a registry operator in that, in that context. Um, but in terms of our role, um, we don't feel that we should be engaged in content questions full stop. We right. have a unique role. Right. And, and to broaden it a bit, uh, CDA 230 has been, as John Morris mentioned, read fairly broadly by the courts to offer fairly sweeping uh, immunity protection to a whole host of types of sites and services that evolved after uh, the rise of the internet and dot-com world. Um, Daniel Citron and Chris Wolf, let me bring you in at this point. Um, feel free to comment on anything you've already heard uh, John or Brian say, but also talk to us about the sort of challenges or controversies that have been raised by a world governed by 230. Danielle? Please. So, you know, Section 230 was designed to, if I, you know, we could debate about why, but it was designed to provide good Samaritans that were, um, to provide them protection for the private screening and blocking of offensive material, right? And so what that's meant, you know, it's been interpreted very broadly. And it means that it covers and provides immunity to sites whose sole purpose is to defame, harass, and attack individuals. So sites like The Dirty, AutoAdmit, Encyclopedia Dramatica. So you have sites that sort of benefit Right, from very salacious, defamatory, disturbing information that can ruin people's lives and careers. But yet, of course, they're provided Section 230 um, immunity. Um, and I think what happens is that immunity sort of says, look, we are really only in the balance of values. We're only going to value our harassers or you know, some of defamers' speech. Right? We're not going to have any balance or thoughtful consideration of other sides, you know, other values at issue. Um, and we know that in print media, we have, there isn't a broad immunity, right, for print media. We, we can be nuanced and thoughtful in balancing the different values at stake, post New York Times v. Sullivan. Um, and the world hasn't fallen apart, right? We still have, uh, well, I shouldn't say that about print media, but, you know, not for the <laughs> reasons of immunity or lack of, right? Um, and so I think that we should consider that we can think through um, bringing to the table other sets of values, not just the, you know, let's say the harassers free speech, but thinking about ways in which we can balance those interests, <coughs> bring to the table those interests. Um, because sometimes it's so difficult to find the perpetrators. The party in the sort of optimal position to address harm is often the content provider or, or the host. And so I think Brian is totally right that we have to think about the different kinds of intermediaries because the standard of care that we might expect for an ISP, uh, for Brian's organization, I think should be very different from the content host like an auto emitter encyclopedia dramatica. So I think I'm saying something controversial. So Daniel, <laughs> let me follow up really like, quickly yes, before we are. turn to Chris. Um, <laughs> so what you're saying is you would like to see the legal standard for the internet look more like it has for traditional print media, or is it there's something more specific that you would like to see the law tweak to accomplish? Right. So. So often, I think, what we want to do is obviously find the perpetrators, because that's, those are the harm doers. And often, we either can't find them, and information state, you know, very damaging information stays online. And so I think we ought to consider things like notice and track. So you give notice to an intermediary, they then track the IP address. You know, people kind of, there's default right. privacy, but then we lose it, um, or notice and take down. So I'm not entirely sure if we want to totally shift to the way we think about print media, but it's a... Uh, have a conversation about okay, it. Okay, I'm going to unpack that a bit more in a follow-up question, but okay. let me bring Chris Wolf into this first. Now, Chris, you've dealt with this in some specific contexts, such as hate speech and other things. Talk to us about sure. how you've dealt with that particular pathology. In, in fact, I'm here wearing uh, kind of a different hat than, than my Hogan Lovell's hat where I chair the privacy practice, uh, because for uh, 17 years, I guess, I've led the internet uh, hate 
task force of the Anti-Defamation League, and as a result of that, came to chair the International Network Against Cyber Hate based in Holland, and currently co-chair with an Israeli cabinet minister a uh, interparliamentary task force on internet hate speech, which I'm happy to say uh, Danielle sits on, as well as Jeff Rosen, who some of you heard from earlier today. And, and we have witnessed that just as the internet has grown as this incredible medium of communication and entertainment and education, it also has been adopted by, by the haters of the world, many of whom hide behind the veil of anonymity, uh, but who engage in things ranging from cyberbullying uh, on one end of the spectrum all the way up to terrorist uh, attack planning on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and as John pointed out, the interme intermediaries largely have legal immunity uh, for much of that uh, activity. Uh, and as a proud First Amendment lawyer, even though a former French uh, Minister of Justice yelled at me at a conference in France, stop hiding behind the First Amendment, uh, which I'm proud to do, it's much stronger than I am, uh, I, I really do believe in Section 230 and in the immunity it provides, but I don't think that necessarily absolves the intermediaries of uh, moral and ethical responsibility as, as important players in the Internet community, and, and neither do they, because that's why we have terms of service at the major sites that all of us uh, frequent uh, that prohibit typically harassment and hate speech uh, and speech that uh, offends human dignity or that incites. Uh, but we, what we also find is that uh, those terms of service, uh, first, are not uh, robustly enforced, in large part because of the scale of the problem. And secondly, we're not quite sure what they mean. Uh, Jeff Rosen wrote an article in the New York Times Magazine in 2008 about uh, Nicole Wong, who then worked for Google, and she was the arbiter of what was in bounds or out of bounds. And so at the Anti-Defamation League, uh, we're calling for more transparency about what is the definition of hate speech. Can we have some discussion about what that means? And in fact, we're going to be meeting, our task force is going to be meeting at Stanford in May to have that discussion uh, with the interme intermediaries. And then we can have a discussion about what is it should they, that they should do. Uh, and two of the things that we talk about, in addition to just straight takedown, uh, is education, education of the people who see this content so they can put it in perspective, um, and counter speech, giving a platform to others to try to counter the effects of hate speech. And I'll give just two examples of where that, where that has worked successfully. If you put in the search term Jew, or at least if you, you used to put in the search term Jew into the Google search engine, one of the top listings that came up would be Jew Watch, which is a virulently anti-Semitic site. And we went to Google and we talked about it and we said, can you do something so this doesn't happen? And they said, uh, no. Uh, our algorithm is our algorithm. The search results are the search results. And we went back and forth. And where we ended up was a free sponsored link that Google provides that says, we're as offended as you are by the first, first search result. Uh, to learn more about anti-Semitism, click here. And it takes you to the ADL site, which we thought was a fair compromise. Uh, likewise, on the Amazon site, Amazon sells uh, the classic anti-Semitic trope, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Uh, the ADL asked them not to. They said this is a published work. It can be used for scholarship and perfect, uh, perfectly legitimate research. It also can be bought by people like the guy who shot the guard at the Holocaust Museum, and it was. Uh, and so we tried to come up with a compromise there, and actually they have content that explains that the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a classic anti-Semitic trope. For more information, click here. So we thought those were creative solutions. So we, we, we believe strongly in Section 230, but remember Section 230 originally was thought of as a, as a way to immunize editing. Uh, and to immunize the free speech rights of the, of the intermediaries as they shape the content that they want the public to see or they think is appropriate for the public to see. And uh, what we've been stressing is with that immunity comes an obligation, some responsibility, and we haven't gotten as far as we should in defining what that responsibility is. So, so Chris, let me build on this to start the conversation rolling here. Let's talk about sort of a spectrum of responses uh, to uh, 2230 and how you've uh, taken this on this in a sort of self-regulatory way. You've worked with these uh, these nonprofits or these other organizations to deal with these corporations and say, would you please self-regulate or even, uh, I hope this isn't too strong of a term, but would you self-censor in a way? If they wouldn't go that far, would you offer a counter-speech alternative? So that might be one part of the spectrum. Um, of course, at the other end is sort of a hard-nosed 230 defense that says, no, that's just tough luck. You know, this is the way the algorithm or, or the, the, the search or whatever else works. 
Um, and then on the opposite end would be maybe something closer to what Danielle's talking about, maybe a, native, a notice and takedown regime modeled after something like the DMCA for copyright, or maybe something more uh, affirmative in terms of a policing obligation. So there we have sort of a spectrum of options. So just so I understand it, the, the model that you're articulating, Chris, uh, fits more that self-regulatory uh, model, but would you say that's enough? Do you think it's comprehensive enough? For example, does, this, the, does the deal you brokered with Google apply to Bing? Does it apply to other search engines that are lesser known? Does it apply to other types of search that may be embedded within social network sites where it's unclear who's providing it? And then so on. How, how far do you sure. get that and, scale And up? the answer is no. We haven't come up with an industry code of conduct or industry standards. And I think ultimately our task force envisions that that will be what happens. What we want to happen after the Stanford meeting in May is that we come up with a set of principles that we then take to the parliamentarians of the world who sit at the larger group that we report to. We're meeting in Brussels in 2013 and try to have them take home these principles. Now, what's interesting is they believe that the law is a solution. And in many countries outside of the United States, hate speech is illegal. Uh, denying the Holocaust is illegal. Uh, selling cufflinks with swastikas is illegal. We all remember the, the Yahoo case, uh, which caused some real conflicts of law. So we actually think we can do some good in diminishing the use of, the law, of law outside of the United States as a censorship tool. And uh, I have an interesting ally. I was at a meeting in Berlin in November and I met with the German government official who's charged with uh, policing anti-Semitism online. And th they've used that law very infrequently, but she says that the, the place where it's the most important is the trivialization of the Holocaust, where people talk about, uh, she used PETA as an example, she thought talking about uh, killing animals as equivalent to the real Holocaust trivializes the Holocaust. And so she, they're more engaged in education uh, than, than in, in the use of the law. And we think that's a, hopefully a byproduct. I also, there, there's a whole range of things. I threw out an idea uh, to the New York Times as a letter to the editor. Little did I know it would then be picked up as part of their Sunday dialogue on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And I said, what about some of the inter intermediaries uh, not allowing anonymity? Because people hide behind the mask of anonymity and say and do some outrageous things. Well, uh, people anonymously sent me some outrageous <laughs> messages, uh, <laughs> uh, reminding me what I already knew, which is anonymity plays a very important role in free expression. Mm -hmm. uh, but that still doesn't mean that you need to be assaulted when you see a news article by the, by the comments that are not germane sure. or simply intemperate. And so, that, so the question, though, is, of course, who decides, and is it a legal versus a self-regulatory approach? So I'm very much in favor of, of self-regulatory approach, and I think it's consistent with my defense and, and support of the First Amendment. And uh, I just don't think we've started to try as hard as we should. Okay. Uh, and maybe I'll change my, my view if the self-regulatory <laughs> approach doesn't make much progress after the next 17 years that I'm involved with the issue. Well, I'd like to, un <laughs> I'd like to unpack in a moment <laughs> the idea of sort of codes of conduct and uh, industry standards and self-regulation a bit more. But first, let me bring Danielle back into this because let's go to that next uh, s uh, step up the spectrum and talk about where it gets a little bit more legalistic with a sort of notice, full-blown notice and takedown regime or something close to it. Uh, there are those, if I can uh, challenge you, but there are those in the copyright context who believe that there is a so-called chilling effect associated with overzealous use of DMCA to take down certain types of content. Um, one could imagine the same complaint being leveled against an effort to take down harassing or, or <coughs> a hateful speech online, which is, uh, by some accounts, probably even in a more amorphous standard than what is copyrighted content. How do you respond to that? Right, so um, I think in two ways. Um, you know, inevitably, we're also going to see chilling. I think we sort of overlook the fact that we're going to see chilling when people are harassed, defamed, right? So we're not just going to have chilling of the take, you know, what's taken down, but also inevitably we're forgetting about or overlooking or trivializing the sort of chilling that we're seeing when people are targeted online. Um, they withdraw, they shut down their websites, they sort of disengage both online, offline, right? So I think we shouldn't overlook that. Um, but so how do we prevent, I think, over chilling, which we're going to see, you know, at least the complaint is that there's too much chilling um, in the copyright context. I mean, perhaps one way to think about it is to ensure that we have some sort of penalty on the other side. Let's say there's a, I think you need a few things, right? If you, let's say you have a notice and track regime, right? Then 
it should only be that the maybe IP you should address, explain in a line okay. or two. Notice and track. So let's say um, there's been a case of harassment, and someone wants to complain um, to a website operator, give notice that they're being harassed or defamed online. Um, that would then, if we change 230, which I know sounds like heresy, but if we change 230, so that once providers, let's say content provide, you know, uh, hosts. Um, got notice of harassment, defamation, that they then would have to keep IP addresses, right, to somehow, if it's possible, um, track who the perpetrators are so that the victim could then sue or proceed with law enforcement. Now, it's not perfect, of course, because they're all sorts of anonymizing technology, so no matter what, a, you know, a, let's say Automate would do to, to track IP addresses, let's say, for example, it may be sort of fruitless, and that's, that's right, but um, doesn't mean that everyone's that smart, right? Uh, the perpetrators are always that brilliant. Um, but before that IP address would then be turned over to the victim, you could build into the law that you need a court order, like a John Doe subpoena. Um, that would have very rigorous requirements that need to be met so that we respect the right to anonymity. That's, of course, something we're so committed to. So just so I'm clear on this, a, a site would not be permitted to hold itself out to the public as a completely private setting where there'll right. be no tracking. You would be required to be tracing more information about, and now, of course, there's such a thing as a privacy debate notice. that's going on right, right. now that would, this would raise tensions in another part of the cyber law community, would it, would it not? Right, but only, uh, but only in when, so not traceable anonymity as a default rule, but rather uh, that, that IP addresses be tracked and kept, there's notice of harassment. And then with a penalty on the backside, that is, if someone makes a complaint and then tries to seek the information, like court order, um, if it's clearly frivolous, the court says there's no way, this is just you're simply serving yourself, um, that there would be a penalty attached. Before we go any so further. So we might think twice yeah. before doing it. So let me ask, and John, if you can jump in here, feel free, but I know there's limited what you can say in your role <laughs> as a government official, but the, what does the law say about anonymity, traceable anonymity, piercing the veil of anonymity right now? We have the Dendrite standard, we have other types of legal standards that right now you can go and try to make a case out of something, if you feel you've been harmed or aggrieved in some fashion. So, uh, John, are you able to explain that to us, or do, should I pass, <laughs> pass that along to Chris and Daniel? Well, I mean, speaking just individually, just, you know, just recounting, um, you know, um, the, the, the legal standards, that the, there, are, there are two or three standards out there that, that allow the, um, that would allow a plaintiff to, to try to pierce anonymity. Um, Dendrite is one, Cahill is another, there are two or three other standards, and they all are kind of similar. There are debates as to which is better, which is worse. Um, but um, in the end, um, the, the, a plaintiff would have to make a, a, at least some showing that they really do have a, a legitimate claim, that it's not just you know, a, an effort to smoke, to, to, to uncover someone's identity, that they in fact have, have a legal claim. I don't know, does that get it? So in Danielle's uh, construct, there would have to be a tort claim, otherwise you don't find out the identity of the person who's engaged in harassment, and the harassment you're talking about doesn't necessarily rise to the level of an actionable tort, does it? Um, I think it will. It, for intentional infliction of emotional distress and defamation, um, you're right, they're really tough. They're expensive, it's expensive to sue, they're tough to prove. Um, but I, it, a lot of the cases that I focus on in my work would, set, would come very close to meeting it. So, so just so I'm clear, um, the, the, what you're talking about, Danielle, is, is at a uh, site level for a specific site operator. Right. So if, if Brian is right. working at the registry, you're not talking about no. applying this there. No. I mean, Brian, you couldn't probably absorb a mandate like that. I mean, it would be hard to know how that would be implemented anyway, right? Very difficult. Right. Um, at the end of the day, you know, if this were an evolution in terms of practice, the takedown requests are coming to registries uh, on a higher volume, and that would increase the volume of takedown requests. Part of the Do you have any metric on when you say higher volume, like how many more or how often? We're, we're well into the hundreds uh, last year, and I'm hiring a new person uh, to uh, add to a team of two. And to, what, does to that, what does that entail when you talk about you're getting more and more? What it, more and more law enforcement requests to take down okay. particular .org names. And so the volume is increasing. Um, ICE has been very active on, on fronts that you've all read about. But it's not just in the U.S. It's, uh, the, there's a global dimension here in terms of taking down uh, web addresses, domain names. And Mostly so, related to 
which particular well particular. you do see intellectual property right. sometimes you see from a government perspective we you know we also have the WikiLeaks right. example uh, there's there's a variety and again it's a global problem for registries so number one we are a US based corporation we comply with the law if we receive a court order uh, or a subpoena will do what the law tells us to do but there's a there's a bigger problem here and I think where we need to focus and I'm very glad that Chris brought it out is I believe that codes of conduct is where we need to, to drive very hard as an industry not just in this debate but in in SOPA and and looking outside the US the challenge for law enforcement with the explosion of the internet you know back in the good old days when it was just telcos there was a small number of companies they had good relationships with law enforcement they followed due process, they got subpoenas, but with the explosion of service providers now, there's a genuine challenge for law enforcement as to where do I put my finger in the hole in the dike? Who do I go to? And so by default, they're looking at registries and saying, ah, there's the source, let's go push there. So I think we need to expand this debate and, and talk about what we can do as industry service providers with law enforcement, with government representatives, with uh, intellectual property representatives as well, and everyone take a hard look at, are there foundational principles around due process and free speech? Are, are there best practices we can begin to frame out that will allow the various service providers, not just registries, to begin to address these problematic issues? Good. But I Good. think the problem is not everybody is as right-minded as you are, Brian. And with immunity, uh, it's going to be hard to get some of the players to the table because they say, what, what do I have to gain and I have everything to lose? Right now, the law doesn't penalize me for, uh, for enacting standards, mm -hmm. uh, for not enacting standards, rather, or not enforcing standards. And so if I adopt a code of conduct, uh, you know, maybe I'll have the FTC uh, come after me for a Section 5 violation if I don't live up to the code of conduct. So, well, okay, let's, before we get into that, one step back. The code of conduct and who sets these codes or establish, I mean, let's take your example, Chris, of what you, the deal you brokered with Google. Let's uh, imagine a hypothetical where you could broaden that out, working with ADL and other types of search providers, and then other types of social media operators, because obviously I don't think you'd want to stop necessarily at just the search layer of the net. Who makes these calls? I mean, you mentioned the New York Times piece talking about how Nicole Wong was the decider within Google, but who's right. the decider for this task force or this code of conduct operator? Is it international? What about other types of uh, ethnic groups and, and uh, aggrieved communities? I mean, you did this for the search term Jew. Right. Well, there's a lot of other offensive <laughs> words in, this, in, in the world. So what about those other groups? And there are a lot of NGOs in the world who are interested in this. We're not alone in that. When I chaired the International Network Against Cyber Hate, it was NGOs from around the world. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center is really interested in the, su in the subject and, and others. But you're right, there needs to be a discussion of what constitutes hate speech. You know, I don't want to pick on Facebook, especially since they're a client, but they allow... <laughs> That'd be bad. <laughs> they allow uh, Holocaust denial groups on Facebook. You can sign up for Holocaust denial groups and participate in those discussions. My face, when it was truly in existence, did not allow those kinds of groups. And we've tried to explain uh, to Facebook that Holocaust denial is hate speech per se and is generally viewed as that. Uh, so Chris, let me interrupt. So there's some issues or some topics for which counter speech is just not the answer. It's not good enough for you. Another example is there was last uh, spring there sprung up uh, on Facebook and as an app on Apple, interestingly, uh, third intifada app and third intifada groups. And most of the content was in Arabic, but if you looked at it, it basically said, if you're interested in killing Jews, come to, you know, please talk to me. And so there were discussion groups, there were videos, how to kill a Jew was one of the videos. Uh, Apple immediately took it down and Facebook initially said, well, we think this is like the, the Holocaust denial groups, but then waited, then in two days saw the content and the content clearly violated their terms of service and, and they took it down. Okay, but I'm sorry to, 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 to keep following up on this, but as a legal standard, isn't this sort of already decided, at least in the States? I mean, going back to Nazis marching in Skokie, right? I mean, there's been cases where right. hateful speech has passed constitutional so muster. So what we are talking context. about is perfectly, typically, perfectly legal speech. The Third Intifada came really close to the line to okay. incitement, uh, the calling fire in a right. crowded theater. But we're talking about perfectly legal speech. Uh, Cyberbullying is, it perhaps is legal. Right. Uh, but it nevertheless leads to the, the suicides of, uh, of affected teens, and, and people generally are against that. Right. Uh, so we're talking about speech that may be legal but is undesirable, right. and that the intermediaries have the ability, and I think the obligation, to have a more civil 
environment so, as Danielle points out, people are not intimidated from participating and can enjoy all the benefits of the services provided by the intermediaries. And, and Danielle, to bring you back in, um, obviously you want to take it to that next step where we involve uh, a tweak in, what would your tweak require? We'd, we'd have to reopen 230 and have the, the standard change so that it allowed for essentially sort of a, almost a reputational carve out along the lines of what we have for IP and other federal crimes? You know, I think I just think we want, I want us to think about it. That is to accept 230 as an unalloyed good, I think is a mistake. I think we don't appreciate the problems that come with it. Not all intermediaries are virtuous, right? They're not all, um, I mean, Google, for instance, has only done this, you know, the response, sponsored ads in like basically two or three cases. Kill, uh, the um, uh, Jew Watch or Jew, uh, so for su when someone searches suicide, um, they'll put up a sponsor look for the suicide hotline. Um, and third was an image of Michelle Obama where she was sort of morphed to look like a monkey, right? So th those were taken down or de-indexed. But that's actually only three cases I could find. Um, so not intermediaries, and they have very different definitions of hate speech. They're all over the map. Um, and I think what Chris is trying to do is bring some consistency by way of absolutely voluntary efforts. So don't offend the First Amendment. They're free to choose and reject it, right? Um, I want us to think about, so I'm not sure if I'm committing myself to notice and track or okay. notice and take down, but to think about other ways of um, pressuring, I think, the parties in the most optimal position to prevent harm. So to bring it back to my uh, day Sorry, job, uh, some think that the uh, the progress that's been made to do not track. I know that's outside the bounds of this discussion. But no, the, it shouldn't be. I but, want to get to that. But the progress that's been made to do not track is in part because of the threat of a controlling law right. or regulation. Uh, and so I think Danielle's discussion of perhaps reopening Section 230 may uh, help my efforts to have voluntary codes of conduct. Developed. Well, uh, okay, that's a good point. Let's let's follow up on this, and it's not out of bounds of the discussion because I think that there is, and I should uh, reveal that I'm not. Uh, I'm trying to be the objective moderator here, but I, I clearly have a view, and you can read it in the pages of Forbes last year where I called 230 the Internet's greatest law. So I think you know where I'm coming from, uh, and I'm working on a, a lengthy paper with uh, First Amendment attorney Robert Cornerveer on this right now. Where we're essentially arguing that what's happening is that we're beginning to see th through privacy and other sort of harassment claims the beginning of a sort of carve out to 230. It may not be that we ever reopen 230. It could just be that we sort of whittle away at it. And certainly when you see things in the privacy context, not so much do not track, but something like an eraser button or a right to be forgotten, yeah. or you start talking about the sort of things that the Brits are doing with super injunctions. And then you start to integrate into it something like wh what you're discussing, uh, discussing, Danielle, in terms of a sort of notice and uh, track or even something more full-blown as notice and uh, takedown, mm -hmm. then you definitely would have a sort of legal carve-out to 230. So again, there's a spectrum there, but what I hear you saying is that, uh, is that we'll start with a sort of voluntary push to see how far we can get intermediaries to go to self-regulate <laughs> slash self-censor, whatever we want to call it, someone or something will decide if that's good enough and then maybe we'll need to act. And, and I should add that I think most intermediaries view this as in their interest, that creating a civil uh, uh, platform, a place that is as free from hate as possible is, is good for their business. So that is their incentive and I think frankly that's gonna be enough of an incentive and I'm not advocating for reopening Section 230. I think it's an interesting discussion. Uh, but we, we've seen a willingness to do this, but we haven't seen the resources committed to it. And frankly, it needs to come to the top of the public agenda. It needs to be something that the public cares about uh, before the companies are going to spend the, the time and resources to really do something serious about it, I think. So are there any models, and Brian and John, feel free to jump back in here. Are there any models for what the, we're discussing here? I mean, in terms of self-regulatory approaches, I can think of some out of the context of the child safety issues that I've covered, maybe there's a model there. Um, Brian, you said you're generally, you think this is generally a good idea. Is there a model that you have in mind? I mean, who's, who's going to do this if we're going to try to preserve 230 as a legal standard, but also have some sort of oversight from uh, some other body? I mean, the, the Brits have this wonderful mm -hmm. term that we don't have in America, Quango, quasi-autonomous non-governmental organizations. Uh, it's a mouthful, but it describes a whole host of sort of third-party entities that aren't government, aren't per purely <clears throat> private, something in between. Right. Um, who or what does this? Well, I think that the same question was actually asked in the SOPA panel. You know, mm -hmm. where do we home this mm -hmm. code of conduct building activity? My mind right now is that um, 
primarily service providers have to step up and create that space and create an ad hoc group. Again, it has to be law enforcement at the table. It has to be service providers in particular. In the multi-stakeholder model, we want civil society at the table. That's one of the three legs of the stool. But I believe there is an opportunity for an ad hoc effort. Now, to be clear, in the domain name space, we operate within ICANN, and, and some of the pressure that I'm reacting to is derives out of the .XXX decision, for example. So .XXX, if we're talking obscenity, CDA, that was approved as a new top-level domain, and we saw some governments react by saying, I'm going to filter. I'm not going to allow that domain or the content associated with that domain to be accessible my, by my citizens. So from the domain name system perspective, we're already seeing the pressure come, pr pressure come from particular vectors. But looking across the globe, uh, another example, uh, at .org, we had uh, a request for a takedown order from New York court for Roja Directa, which was a Spanish site that had um, links to other websites that allowed you to view sporting events. There was a .es for the Spanish site, there was a .org, there was a .com. Well, two Spanish courts had ruled that website to be legal, not infringing. We got an order in an ex parte proceeding out of New York to tell us to take down the .org. This is the tension for us. You know, due process is important, speech is important. This is a global construct we're dealing with. Yes, the CDA is a U.S. legislation, but when I look at the landscape and I see the pressure points coming from governments from a number of different vectors, I feel a distinct urgency that we have to step up now. We're going to have a window of opportunity to build something approximating best practices for all these service providers, and if we don't act very quickly, it's going to close, and we're going to get a patchwork of legislation beyond the U.S., that really makes things difficult. I also John, think that we John, need John this. wanted to get a word yeah. in. Yeah, please. Let me, let me jump in, although, although I'm thrilled with how this panel is going. I'm, I'm <laughs> sitting up here saying nothing, and, <laughs> and, it, and these guys are, are, are heartily endorsing. The, and when you the, had your CD, CDT hat on, we used to have arguments. As well, <laughs> well per, per, perhaps, but, 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 but with my saying nothing, um, you know, the, you guys are, you know, discussing exactly what I would like to discuss, which is the, you know, kind of the need and the value to, um, to, to, to come together in, in collaborative multi-stakeholder efforts to try to figure out solutions. I mean, and l let me just step back and say that, I mean, w one, I think, important development, um, you know, in Europe, but, you know, w with the United States' support, you know, happened last year at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in, in um, in Paris, where, where the OECD adopted in June of last year, the, the, the OECD is an intergovernmental organization with 34 members of the United States and a lot of European countries and Japan and Canada and Australia. And, and the OECD um, adopted um, an, a set of internet policy making principles where just as a general matter, they um, urged with the strong support of the United States, um, strong support of NTIA, but before I was here, my NTIA colleagues, shepherded it through last year, um, um, endorsing a kind of a voluntary multi-stakeholder approach, just as, as Chris and Brian have been talking. Um, you know, w w with the idea of, of you know, trying to create a condi conditions for the, con the continued open, um, innovative development of, of the internet. A and one of the specific principles that the OECD adopted specifically related to intermediaries, and, and it, you know, the, the principal urged um, the member nations of the OECD and other countries that have decided to follow the OECD principles to, to limit um, internet intermediaries liability. Essentially, I think, to, to really take an approach very similar to what the United States ha has taken. Um, and so in joining the OECD principles, the United States you know, really kind of adopted the, the, the view that, that intermediaries and intermediary protection does play an important role in promoting innovation and creativity. But we also, um, you know, then the in internet policy um, principle makes very clear that, that intermediaries can, quote, play an important role by addressing and deterring illegal activity, fraud, misleading and unfair practices conducted over their networks or services. Um, and so, I mean, critically, the, the OECD document urged, just as really it's been discussed up here, that, that governments look to try to convene stakeholders in multi-stakeholder efforts to try to identify appropriate circumstances for intermediaries to take the kinds of actions that, that we're hearing here. And 
you know, back on this side of the Atlantic, um, you know, as probably many of you know, NTIA has been, Department of Commerce has been very active in the consumer privacy area of trying to promote the idea of, of multi-stakeholder um, um, approaches. And, but but our, 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 our view is that, is that it's not limited to consumer privacy, that, that I think the issues we're talking about now um, are areas that, that we, um, you know, can look at. And, and I think NTIA and the Department of Commerce will, in the coming months, be looking at precisely at these issues to see, um, to see if there are some areas where, where the government could contribute to the to, to kind of starting these conversations. Good. Good. Chris, I interrupted. I'm no, sorry, actually, ahead. that was a perfect uh, foundation for the point I wanted to make, which is if we're going to get the rest of the world to adopt this notion of limiting inter intermediary liability, uh, I think that we need to show that the inter intermediaries are going to act responsibly voluntarily through codes of conduct, because we've seen some pretty outrageous <laughs> enforcement actions in Europe. My friend Peter Fleischer from Google was convicted in absentia for quote unquote allowing uh, a video to be posted on YouTube that violated Italian privacy law because it showed a disabled child being harassed. In the United States, they would, YouTube would never have liability uh, for that. Uh, likewise, there's a case before the European Court of Justice right now because Google refused to disable a link to a <coughs> website that an individual deemed to be unflattering. Uh, and uh, apparently he didn't go to the website and say, take down your content. He went to Google and said, disable the link. That is actually before the European Court of Justice. So, Chris, let me challenge you and Danielle on this, and then I'm going to turn to questions, so get ready, and you'll, you'll need to come to the microphone and state your name and affiliation. Um, I want to challenge both of you on, on this and, and, and ask this. When I hear this, I'm going to take off my moderator hat for a second. When I hear this argument, it sounds to me like you're saying, we need to harmonize now because of what... We need to come up with better standards now because of the fear that if not, we're going to harmonize in the direction of Europe, which will have more restrictions on intermediary immunity and more aggressive intermediary policing obligations, potentially. So we better do something now. And that sounds to me like we're allowing Europe or some other countries or continents to be the ones who determine what our internet policy and free speech codes are going to be in the United States of America. Now we're sounding like a Republican presidential debate. Uh, <laughs> well, I hope I'm not sounding too much like one of those clowns. So, but anyway. So, so, uh, so which one are you? Uh, the, the question is this. I, I mean, why couldn't we just say America has always been controversial with the First Amendment, right? Because our in, big intermediaries are getting beaten up all over the world. Uh, and if we really do want to promote uh, robust free speech around the world, I think we need to, to make, try our best to make sure that that stops. To be more like Europe. No, not necessarily. <laughs> I think we can promote a responsible civil space on the Internet and not uh, be called European. But if we're called a European, that doesn't offend me particularly. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm ready to start taking some questions if anybody has one. You'll, if you could please come to the microphone so we could hear you on the tape. And uh, microphone's right there. And just uh, state your name and affiliation, and then please ask a question. Hi. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you're good. Hi, I'm Isaac Meister from Stop Badware. Um, you talked an awful lot about CDA 230 and speech and the relative merits of the speech and constitutional issues. Uh, what you omitted, I noted, was speech that actually has no expressive value whatsoever and is, in fact, inherently harmful. I'm thinking of malware. Um, uh, on all of these tech, uh, in the di these digital landscapes, many of them are rich and have the ability to uh, process arbitrary HTML, and they can actually cause harm. Um, and as it stands, CDA 230 immunizes web hosting providers and other intermediaries from ever having to respond to any complaint whatsoever. They have to rely purely on their own self-interest in order to. Uh, uh, to, to take any action, which is often expensive and irritating. Um, is there a place in, is, is there an argument for cutting out a portion of 230 for cases where clearly no expressive speech is at issue just so that um, there is a, a remedy for the clear violation of your rights in your own computer when you visit such Before a we site? get an answer to that, it's a good question. Uh, I just mentioned that there is some literature on this issue and you might want to check out on that point. Yeah. 
uh, piece by Doug Lickman and uh, Posner, Eric Posner, on uh, police intermediaries doing more policing for security purposes. And it's one of the different types of issues that we're seeing emerge as a uh, call for greater intermediary uh, deputization, if you will, is to do something about the Internet's various security pathologies, uh, whether it be malware, or viruses, worms, whatever else. Um, anybody have any comment on that? I mean, it's not exactly a pure speech issue, but there are potentially some issues that are raised nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, I think just as a matter of First Amendment law, they're gonna, even though we don't think it seems expressive, source code has been deemed to be, um, have First Amendment protection. So I'm not sure if we, does that make sense, you know? Right. right. That's right. And so, it is, and Section 230 has an exemption um, in addition to intellectual property, it's, it's federal criminal law, but we have to find the host to have committed the federal crime. So you need scienter, you know what I mean? So if you're just that you're hosting a virus with no scienter, you're not engaged in the federal criminal activity, okay. you're gonna be exempt. And that, would, mean, be my, immune, that would be my concern, not for the site that is unresponsive to complaints, but for the site that inadvertently uh, hosts malware or, or other uh, uh, harmful uh, code that infects other people's computers and they're faced with a tort claim for downstream liability. Uh, I think Section 230 was enacted exactly for that situation where, where you're not supposed to have an intermediary exposed to that kind of liability or, there, or they will stop being an inter intermediary. John, you want to say? So let me just jump in to add that I, you know, th this is another area where, where I do think there's, there is value even in multi-stakeholder um, you know, efforts and obviously Stop Badware is, is involved in, in, a, in a current effort that the Department of Commerce has been um, helping to, to, to kickstart um, where, where a broad range of industry and civil society um, you know, participants are coming together to try to figure out ways to address botnets, um, which is related to, not directly um, on what you're asking, but, um, but, but, but I do think even in the cybersecurity area, um, you know, w w we, we should look to um, see what we can do now, not necessarily waiting on legislation, because I, I do think there are things that um, that we can do now in the botnet area. That that is an example of of something where where I'm very hopeful we make progress. Um, you know, in the collaborative, um, non-legislative arena. Uh, I might have a follow-up related to national security out of the sort of broader computer security question, but let's get to Mark first because he'll have something more interesting than I'll have to say. Uh, who knows? Uh, Mark McCarthy with SIA in Georgetown. Um, I want to endorse the, the call for uh, doing some work in the spotnet area. We're involved in that Department of Commerce effort, and I, I think it's the way forward. Um, I, intermediaries um, deal with two different kinds of underlying conduct. One is illegal underlying conduct and the other is undesirable. Um, there are a lot of issues when the underlying conduct is illegal, but at least you have a handle on what you're talking about. It's, it's a violation of privacy or consumer protection or fraud or something. Um, when it's undesirable, you've got a pretty serious slippery slope where it's what we think is not terribly good or terribly nice or sort of harmful but not legally harmful. Um, are you worried about that slippery slope and what it could lead to in terms of everybody getting together, holding hands with the code of conduct and saying that's kind Let's of Let's go to Brian down. first and then work our way down. Brian? Sure. It's a great question. Um, and PIR and its role as registry for .org, we never want to be in, put in the position of being judge and or jury with respect to content. We do take some proactive measures, though. However, we have an anti-abuse program where we've identified particular behaviors that are harmful to the domain name system, harmful to the DNS. So phishing, farming, spam. These are behaviors that, as an infrastructure operator, are harmful to the DNS. And we proactively identify them, and we proactively address them under our own anti-abuse program. And we would encourage every service provider in their respective roles in the ecosystem to take the same approach. Taking the next step forward, if we were to do code of conduct, we would keep that very careful eye on not becoming the judge or jury on content issues, and that would inform 
whatever best practices could result from this type of an effort I've been describing. Anybody else on that point? I was just going to say, if, if counter speech and education could pick up the slack and deal with the societal effects of undesirable but legal speech, then I would say let it all uh, go out there. But that's simply not the case. And so that's, that's why I come down where I do. Before Barron probably mentions it anyway with his question, Mark McCarthy has a great chapter on this issue in a book that Barron edited called Next Digital Decade. He didn't mention it, but it's probably the best overview of all of these challenges and controversies that I've seen in recent uh, memory. No, I don't agree with all of it. So. Well, I actually wasn't going to mention that, but I will mention now that you mentioned it. That's a free ebook. It's available at <laughs> nextdigitaldecade.com and in all good uh, ebook stores. And I have a chapter in it, too. Yeah. That's yes, right. indeed. Chris does, too. I'm sorry. Uh, and I invited Danielle, too, but it didn't work out. But I was uh, writing my own book, so you forgave me, right? Indeed. And Adam has two excellent chapters, and there are probably a few other authors in here. <laughs> Nobody asked me. <laughs> yeah, same here, you know. Uh, Chris also has a good chapter in there. And anyway, so let's make this, this is all somewhat academic, so let's make this very concrete. Suppose that you are providing counsel to, let's say, the new government of Tunisia on how to write an internet law. Uh, in the U.S., we often talk about how, you know, um, we're concerned about what a future president might do, and that's a somewhat hypothetical concern because we have a pretty good tradition of the rule of law in this country, and we're pretty comfortable that things aren't going to go really too haywire. But, but there are lots of countries around the world where that's not true, and just to make this really concrete, suppose, again, that you're in Tunisia, and you have an opportunity to get through now because of the fact that they've been through this revolution, that they were driven in large part by, by bloggers. Let's just say you have an opportunity to get through a pretty good law that you're comfortable with, but you really worry what's coming down the road. And this builds very much on Mark's question to say, where is that slippery slope going to go? So, so Danielle, so Chris, I mean, how, how much do you want to carve out from 230? And, and how do you see that, how do you prevent that from being abused either in a really obvious way by an authoritarian regime or, or in a soft and more subtle way, such as, in fact, we ourselves have seen here in the U.S. with campus speech codes, where the speech code is, is sort of nice and bubbly, but it's used to, well, frankly, suppress uh, heterodox speech. So again, how do you promote freedom, uh, understanding that you know, you're not going to be making all those decisions, and in fact, other governments will use any, any tool they can as leverage, especially against an intermediary, maybe not in in a direct area, but Joe Lieberman calls Amazon, gets them to shut off hosting to WikiLeaks. That happens here in the US where we supposedly have the rule of law. Just think what happens in, in other countries. Right, so I think that's a terrific follow-up question for Mark's concern. And I think, you know, the slippery slope argument, to me, um, it's not monolithic, right? So we have different slippery slope concerns depending on, as Brian would say, who the intermediary is, right? I think we have much greater concerns about um, the power of some intermediaries where I would say, listen, we should be hands off. They, um, you know, search engines, ISPs, I think just normatively, we don't want them to be in the business of filtering, let's say, for example. Um, but at the content level, uh, maybe we think, listen, that's how we make free speech norms. We do it sort of um, house by house, where, places that we live. We make a set of, you know, we negotiate norms. And that's what these sites would be, in some sense, if under Chris's prescription, be doing, right? Coming up with a set of codes um, that sounds like would be have a much more of a minimum standard. And I think for, in my world, what I think about is like, you know, thinking about college um, hate speech codes, um, I, I agree with you that they can be very stifling. And so like Chris, I think I'm more interested in seeing more counter speech. But when it comes to tortious and criminal activity on behalf of the perpetrator, but we can't find the perpetrator, is where I think I'd have a, if I were advising, let's say, the, the Tunisian future president, that we should have really narrow carve outs um, that is noticed and let's say track only in instances where there's a you know a, a powerful case for a tort or a crime, um, so we could identify the perpetrator rather than some very amorphous standard where if you're offended, you know you can take it down. So I'm not sure if it answers the question. Except that being offended is a tort in Islamic countries. Oh right, that's quite true. <laughs> but but you know we know we're almost exporting the First Amendment you know, outside, just because so many are located in the United States, so in some sense. Um, though, but that's a great point. Brian wants to jump in here. Yeah, I, if I were advising the Tunisian lawmaker, my perspective would be that there are some foundational principles, that number one, the architecture of the DNS, the standards-based protocols, is sacrosanct. 
we're having that debate in the SOPA context. To me, that's a, a foundational building block. Um, uh, Secondly, I'd also say, you know, immunity for intermediaries makes a lot of good sense from an operational standpoint for critical infrastructure providers and also for the policy benefits across the board. That's where I'd stop. Look, other countries have different cultures and different norms, as you indicate. I think these are the important foundational principles. I don't mean to suggest, and I think you alluded to it, that this, if we went in this code of conduct direction, we might be becoming more European in terms of adopting their approach versus ours in the regulatory framework. I'm not talking about promoting some sort of harmonization of laws. I'm not talking about tilting more toward Europe or not. What I think is most important in the immediate moment is that industry in particular demonstrate to law enforcement and governments around the world that we can work with you, that we're willing to work with you, that we can do this in a collaborative, cooperative, and principles-based way. To me, that's the most immediate task. The other questions of cultural differences and First Amendment and exporting it, for me, I put that to the side. I think there's a more, a more immediate threat to the ecosystem if we don't get those questions right. So, Adam, I would encourage the Tunisians to adopt Section 230, to fund internet education and literacy training. Uh, and here's a European model that I think we all can follow. There's a government-funded group called Jugendschutz which provides education to young people about responsible use of technology, which is woefully lacking in the United States and which would encompass not just hate speech, but a whole range of things that I think would make all of our lives and their lives a lot better on the internet. Good. Bob? I'm Is Bob Forst and I'm with Google. Um, this discussion bothers me because it's primarily on a legal level as opposed to the real world on a practical level. And what you have to do every day when you're a company, even a small company, and the notion of passing one of these new codes and everybody getting together and singing Kumbaya, and then uh, a company being able to hire the number of people that's necessary uh, to carry out that code is frankly ludicrous. Um, just to put a word on it, it can't happen. Uh, it's much like uh, the National Counterterrorism Center coming to us and saying, we want you to take down every video that is in any way uh, could be related to terrorism. Uh, we talked to them at length. We had a good agreement over things that we could do, and we actually did some positive work with Facebook uh, in order to train people who were moderates uh, in how to get their message out. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm a little bit uh, dubious about the practicality of this. Uh, let me say there's one more thing that I would add to your list of things that uh, I would ask new governments to think about, and that is the notion of the free flow of cross-border uh, uh, information, free flow of information across national borders. Uh, I think that's necessary these days, not only for companies like ours, but for financial institutions, for manufacturing companies, uh, for universities, for almost anybody who's interested in using the, uh, the Internet uh, in a positive way, constructive way, uh, in order to make economies bigger, create jobs, uh, and have uh, folks communicate with each other about topics they care about. Okay, let's get some comments, Brian. So um, I, I take your points head on and accept them on face value. Uh, Public Interest Registry is a not-for-profit organization of 15 employees. I've got a general counsel. I, I have no illusions about um, costs and what we can bear and what we can process. At the same time, if it doesn't go in the direction we're describing and a number of countries begin imposing legislative solutions, possible liability on service providers, it can become even more unworkable than the direction we're describing. So I think we, we've got a choice to make here, and I think it's important that we take a first step. Anybody else? John? Uh, j just to, just to, you know, absolutely agree with, with, with Bob's top line point, which is that, that countries should be looking to promote the free flow of information. And I, if you go back and look at these OECD internet policy making principles, that's the very, very first principle listed in, in, in the document. And so I mean, that is a, you know, I think should be a, a paramount goal. And 
I mean, on, on the practical concerns that Bob, um, are, you know, articulates, um, you know, I, I think in a, in a collaborative process, that kind of concern has to come out, and, and that it's possible that, you know, in a particular situation that, um, that something may not be a practical solution, and, but, but, but something that, that, that I think if we can, you know, sit down and try to figure out, well, what are practical workable solutions to help ease some of these concerns, um, I think we're all better off. And, and part of the comfort I will give you is that I invited uh, Google to participate in our task force, and, there, and one of your colleagues is on the task force, <laughs> and, and bringing, certainly bringing to the table the issues of scale and practicality. At the same time, though, uh, there are decisions that your company is making every day in this area, and part of our mission is to try to bring some transparency to that and some some standards and some understanding about how those decisions are made. And I, I'm sure you wouldn't object to uh, people understanding better how those decisions are made, what stays up, what comes down, and what gets the free sponsored link. Yeah, I think if you look at the YouTube uh, guidelines, for example, the community guidelines, we used to call that out really specifically. Yes. Uh, is it perfect? No. Are we getting there? Yes. I think if you look at the Google Transparency Report, which we put up, which shows the number of countries, uh, countries all over the world, and what they ask us to take down, or how they ask us to block our services. I think we're on the leading edge there. Uh, I, I would also point out that uh, you know we were one of the three companies that uh, uh, decided to try to establish and then join the Global Network Initiative, which is one of these uh, term I absolutely despise multi-stakeholder initiatives that, that's out there. Trying to, to make this happen. Uh, I'm just also trying to point out the other side uh, of the argument that it's difficult to do. But to Brian's comment, I agree with it. If we don't do it, it's going to be done by people who are a lot stupider and with a lot worse intentions. So, so I think Bob's got a good point, but I do want to use the opportunity since Bob asked a question and talked about some of the things that Google's been doing that a lot of the mainstream uh, online operators, social media services, so on and so forth, ISPs, registrars, everybody, they've all been taking good steps and they try to usually do things that I think most of us would find uh, accommodating or helpful. I think the problem is, and I think Danielle's brought this up in her, in her writing, you know, what she is, I, I believe, labeled uh, cyber cesspools. Is yeah. that the term? Um, it's not Google or Facebook or some of these, right? It, it, it's daily dirt. It's, it's, uh, it's juicy campus. Um, so there are these bad apples, right? And that's, it seems to me, to, to ask a bit of a leading question here, that a lot of this debate's being driven by a small handful of very bad apples. And the question is, can we get at them either with self-regulatory efforts or counter-speech efforts, or does the, do we have to upset the entire balance of 230 to get at those most egregious? See, I, I would disagree with you, because I think a problem that I alluded to earlier are the completely intemperate and often hate-filled comments on mainstream news sites where people using the tool of anonymity, but some people also using their real name, say racist, homophobic, anti-Semitic things with some regularity. Now, those of us who you know, have a filter just filter them out. But I'm concerned about kids who see it all the time and consider that to be normal and perhaps even acceptable speech. Uh, and that's on the Washington Post, and it's uh, sometimes on the New York Times. It was on the... Um, the Palm Beach Post, after the Madoff affair, the, the anti-Semitism grew so virulent that, that we finally convinced them to just turn off the comments. Well, and a lot of, a lot of operators, a lot of media operators, mainstream ones, are, are taking that approach, even a lot of smaller operators. I know a lot of my colleagues who blog have turned off comments because they can get so vitriolic. I mean, so, but, but that doesn't you, promote the free exchange of ideas, does it? Well, but well, let me, well, what's the balance here, right? I mean, you're, you're saying that let's have a self-regulatory approach or a code of conduct or something. What's your concrete advice to so those So the New operators? York Times just announced that they're going to have registered users' comments up here first. Mm -hmm. So if you're a reader, you can look at those first and know that these are reliable people who abide by the New York Times standards, and then the others will follow, and you may never get to those. Perhaps I know that that's an approach. There's been other proposals. I know, I think it's Nancy Kim's proposed the idea yeah. of a cooling off period before yeah. comments are posted online, say 15 minutes yeah. before you can comment. I'm not sure if that really is going to stop you from saying something and saying I suggest stupid, that for my partner's emails. <laughs> Um, but Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler in their last book on Nudge uh, recommended something along the lines of that uh, same idea. So 
These are self-regulatory steps. There are steps that if we're implemented by law, there might be some challenges or chilling effects or concerns about where that goes next. Um, but isn't that best left for each of these individual platforms and, and social media operators to decide? I mean, Absolutely. okay, because uh, I'm just not sure, to get back to Bob's point, how we scale up the idea of But they of need to hear standard. from the public that it's something that we care about, because yeah. we really don't want to be subjected to that on a regular basis. Yeah, but, but Danielle, yeah, I wanted to, before I forget this point about the, the, the narrow problem of the most visible yeah. sites that cause so many of these problems, I mean, it's, there are seriously awful things said on a yeah. daily basis on some of those sites. Now, some of them have gone away right. because... Right. Moral pressure, public pressure, the right. spotlight of uh, the you know sunlight disinfectant old old line. I mean, we we expose them for what they were, which were forums for hate. Right. Um, but you maybe think that's not enough, or it wasn't justice served quick enough. I mean, but but in its place is you know college campus sticky drama. You know um, the dirty. Mm -hmm. I mean, auto admit thrives. You have sites that are set up so they're not hosted on, let's say, an auto admit message board, but they're set up with the sole purpose of impersonating someone and of making them undateable. You can't so that they can't be hired. You know, so you have the use of the internet in ways that offline we would say is utterly unacceptable. It's tortious, it's criminal. We would never do it, right? And so um, I, I think we have to capture those bad actors, whether it's through, counter speech doesn't help, right? So when you say someone has herpes, that she should be raped and she lives at Two Englewood Road, Baltimore, Maryland, that um, um, she has rape fantasies and is available. I mean, there's no counter speech that's ever going to offset but that. But there was legal action in on, on auto admit, right? I mean, by two women right. who challenged some of these commenters. Right. What right. happens in those cases? So in that case, it's settled. Um, they could only the plaintiffs could only find I think nine out of the thirty nine posters. Auto admit had a policy of not, not keeping, keeping any, IP right, not addresses retaining right, any IP. scrubbing it, and and so the sort of this cyber mob that developed gave each other advice about how to stay anonymous. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. most of the perpetrators remained anonymous. And when you do Google searches of there are like nine women who are involved in that, you know, not just the two Yale women, but others. The damaging threads predominate the first pages of their names to this day. So, so this brings us full circle and it helps wrap up our conversation because really this is in a way where a lot of the 230 case law began with the questions about anonymity going back to the Zoran case, which many of you probably are familiar with. I mean, there's always been this question about this balance of speech and privacy and you know, uh, you're pushing essentially, Danielle, for some sort of a notice and track that would require a bit of a sacrifice in terms of privacy, because I right. hear plenty of other people saying, that's right. hey, that's great. Don't retain any of that information, right? Right. So that's a real challenging balance. Um, I'm not sure we have any more questions, but it looks like we're coming up to the end of our, our conversation. Does anybody have uh, any closing thoughts they'd like to add here before I wrap things up and go to coffee? We solved all the world's problems, we did. We did. right? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I want to thank all our panelists. Please join me in uh, thanking them for our conversation. Thank you. Thank you.